Hello friends and welcome. I am Marcus and tonight I will be calmly reading for you two short stories entitled A Golden Wedding as well as The Curious Story The Tryst of the White Lady. Let us unwind. Find a calm, comfortable and safe place to relax. Your bed, your chair, your sofa. And let us begin these stories. A Golden Wedding and the land dropped abruptly down from the gate, and a thick, shrubby growth of young apple orchard almost hid the little weather grey house from the road. This was why the young man who opened the sagging gate could not see that it was boarded up, and did not cease his cheerful whistling until he had pressed through the crowding trees and found himself almost on the sunken stone doorstep over which in olden days honeysuckle had been wont to arch. Now only a few straggling uncared-for vines clung forlornly to the shingles, and the windows were, as has been said, all boarded up. The whistle died on the young man's lips, and an expression of blank astonishment and dismay settled down on his face. A good, kindly, honest face it was, although perhaps it did not betoken any pronounced mental gifts on the part of its owner. What can have happened? he said to himself. Uncle Tom and Aunt Sally can't be dead. I'd have seen their deaths in the paper if they was and I'd have thought if they'd moved away it'd been printed too. They can't have been gone long. That flower bed must have been made up last spring. Well, this is a kind of setback for a fella. Here I've been tramping all the way from the station, a thinking how good it would be to see Aunt Sally's sweet old face again, and hear Uncle Tom's laugh and all I find is a boarded-up house going to seed. Spouse, I might as well toddle over to Stetson's and inquire if they haven't disappeared too. He went through the old firs, back of the lot and across the field, to a rather shabby house beyond. A cheery-faced woman answered his knock and looked at him in a puzzled fashion. Have you forgotten me, Mrs. Stetson? Don't you remember Lavelle Stevens? And how you used to give him plum tarts when he'd bring your turkeys home? Mrs. Stetson caught both his hands in a hearty clasp. I guess I haven't forgotten, she declared. Well, well, and you're Lavelle. I think I ought to know your face. Though you've changed a lot. Fifteen years have made a big difference in you. Come right in. Pa, this is Lavelle. You mind Lavelle, the boy Aunt Sally and Uncle Tom had for years. Reckon I do, drawled John Stetson with a friendly grin. Ain't likely to forget some of the capers you used to be cutting up. You filled out considerable. Where have you been for the last ten years? Aunt Sally fretted a lot over you, thinking you was dead or gone to the bed. Lavelle's face clouded. I know I ought to have written, he said repentantly, but you know I'm a terrible poor scholar, and I'd do most anything than try to write a letter. But where's Uncle Tom and Aunt Sally gone? Surely they ain't dead. No, said Jonah Stetson slowly. No, but I guess they'd rather be. They're in the poorhouse. The poorhouse? Aunt Sally in the poorhouse? exclaimed Lavelle. 
Yes, and it's a burning shame, declared Mrs. Stetson. Aunt Sally's just breaking her heart from the disgrace of it. But it didn't seem as if it could be helped. Uncle Tom got so crippled with rheumatism, he couldn't work, and Aunt Sally was too frail to do anything. They hadn't any relations, and there was a mortgage on the house. There wasn't any when I went away. No, they had to borrow money six years ago, when Uncle Tom had his first spell of rheumatic fever. This spring it was clear that there was nothing for them but the poor house. They went three months ago, and terrible hard they took it, especially Aunt Sally. I felt awful about it myself. Jonah and I would have took them, if we could, but we just couldn't. We've nothing but Jonah's wages, and we have eight children, and not a bit of spare room. I go over to see Aunt Sally as often as I can, and take her some little thing. But I don't know, she wouldn't rather not see anybody than see them in the poorhouse. Lavelle weighed his hat in his hands, and frowned over it reflectively. Who owns the house now? Peter Townley. He held the mortgage, and all the old furniture was sold too. And that most killed Aunt Sally. But do you know what she's fretting over most of all? She and Uncle Tom will have been married fifty years in a fortnight's time, and Aunt Sally thinks it's awful to have to spend their golden wedding anniversary in the poorhouse. She talks about it all the time. You're not going, Lavelle. For Lavelle had risen. You must stop with us since your old home is closed up. We'll scare you up a shakedown to sleep on, and you're welcome as welcome. I haven't forgotten the time you caught Mary Ellen just as she was tumbling into the well. Thank you. I'll stay to tea, said Lavelle, sitting down again. But I guess I make my headquarters up at the station hotel as long as I stay around here. It's kind of more central. Got on pretty well out west, eh? queried Jonah. Pretty well for a fellow who had nothing but his two hands to depend on when he went out, said Lavelle cautiously. I've only been a laboring man, of course, but I've saved up enough to start a little store when I go back. That's why I've come east for a trip now, before I'd be tied down to business. I was hankering to see Aunt Sally and Uncle Tom once more. I'll never forget how kind and good they was to me. There I was when Dad died, a little sinner of eleven, just heading for destruction. They give me a home and all the schooling I ever had, and all the love I ever got. It was Aunt Sally's teachings made as much a man of me as I am. I never forget him and I've tried to live up to him. After tea, Lavelle said he thought he'd stroll up the road and pay Peter Townley a call. Jonah Stetson and his wife looked at each other when he had gone. Got something in his eye, nodded Jonah. Him and Peter weren't never much of friends. Maybe Aunt Sally's bread is coming back to her after all said his wife. People used to be hard on Lavelle, but I always liked him, and I'm real glad he's turned out so well. Lavelle came back to the Stensons the next evening. In the interval, he had seen Aunt Sally and Uncle Tom. The meeting had been both glad and sad. Lavelle had also seen other people. I've bought Uncle Tom's old house from Peter Townley, he said quietly, and I want you folks to help me out with my plans. Uncle Tom and Aunt Sally ain't going to spend their golden wedding in the poor house. No, sir. They'll spend it in their own home with their old friends about them. But they are not to know anything about it till the very night. Do you suppose any of the old furniture could be got back? 
I believe every stick of it could, said Mrs. Stetson excitedly. Most of it was bought by folks living handy, and I don't believe one of them would refuse to sell it back. Uncle Tom's old chair is here, to begin with. Aunt Sally gave me that herself. She said she couldn't bear to have it sold. Mrs. Isaac Appleby at the station bought a set of pink sprigged china, and James Parker bought the grandfather's clock, and the whatnot is at Stanton Gray's. For the next fortnight, Lavelle and Mrs. Stetson did so much traveling around together that Jonah said genially he might as well be a bachelor as far as meals and buttons went. They visited every house where a bit of Aunt Sally's belongings could be found. Very successful they were too. And at the end of their chanting, the interior of the little house behind the apple trees looked very much as it had looked when Aunt Sally and Uncle Tom lived there. Meanwhile, Mrs. Stetson had been revolving a design in her mind, and one afternoon she did some canvassing on her own account. The next time she saw Lavelle, she said, we ain't going to let you do it all. The women folks around here are going to furnish the refreshments for the golden wedding, and the girls are going to decorate the house with golden rod. The evening of the wedding anniversary came. Everybody in Blair was in the plot, including the matron of the poorhouse. That night, Aunt Sally watched the sunset over the hills through bitter tears. I never thought I'd be celebrating my golden wedding in the poorhouse, she sobbed. Uncle Tom put his twisted hands on her shaking old shoulders. But before he could utter any words of comfort, Lavelle Stevens stood before them. Just get your bonnet on, Aunt Sally, he cried jovially, and both of you come along with me. I've got a buggy here for you and you might as well say goodbye to this place, for you're not coming back to it any more. Lavelle, oh, what do you mean? said Aunt Sally tremulously. I'll explain what I mean as we drive along. Hurry up, the folks are waiting. When they reached the little old house, it was all aglow with light. Aunt Sally gave a cry as she entered it. All her old household goods were back in their places. There were some new ones too, for Lavelle had supplied all that was lacking. The house was full of their old friends and neighbors. Mrs. Stetson welcomed them home again. Oh, Tom, whispered Aunt Sally, tears of happiness streaming down her old face. Oh, Tom, isn't God good? They had a right royal celebration, and a supper such as the Blair housewives could produce. There were speeches and songs and tales. Lavelle kept himself in the background, and helped Mrs. Stetson cut cake in the pantry all the evening. But when the guests had gone, he went to Aunt Sally and Uncle Tom, who were sitting by the fire. Here's a little golden wedding present for you, he said awkwardly, putting a purse into Aunt Sally's hand. I reckon there's enough there to keep you from ever having to go to the poorhouse again. And if not, there'll be more where that comes from when it's done. There were twenty-five bright twenty-dollar gold pieces in the purse. We can't take it, Lavelle protested Aunt Sally. You can't afford it. Don't you worry about that, laughed Lavelle. Out west, men don't think much of a little wad like that. I owe you far more than can be paid in cash, Aunt Sally. You must take it. I want to know there's a little home here for me, and two kind hearts in it, no matter where I roam. God bless you said Uncle Tom huskily. You don't know what you've done for Sally and me. 
That night, when Lavelle went to the little bedroom of the parlor, for Aunt Sally, rejoicing in the fact that she was again mistress of a spare room, would not hear of his going to the station hotel. He gazed at his reflection in the gilt-framed mirror soberly. You've just got enough left to pay your passage back west, old fellow, he said. And then it's begin all over again, just where you begun before. But Aunt Sally's face was worth it all. Yes, sir. And you've got your two hands still, and an old couple's prayers and blessings. Not such a bad capital, Lavelle. Not such a bad capital. The Tryst of the White Lady I wished you'd get married, Roger, said Catherine Ames. I'm getting too old to work. Seventy last April. And who's going to look after ye when I'm gone? Get married, boy. Get married. Roger Temple winced. His aunt's harsh, disagreeable voice always jarred horribly on his sensitive nerves. He was fond of her, after a fashion, but always that voice made him wonder if there could be anything harder to endure. Then he gave a bitter little laugh. Who'd have me, Aunt Catherine? he asked. Catherine Ames looked at him critically across the supper table. She loved him in her way, with all her heart, but she was not in the least blind to his defects. She did not mince matters with herself or with other people. Roger was a sallow, plain-featured fellow, small and insignificant-looking. And, as if this were not bad enough, he walked with a slight limp, and had one thin shoulder, a little higher than the other. Jarback Temple, he had been called in school. And the name still clung to him. To be sure, he had very fine grey eyes, but their dreamy brilliance gave his dull face an uncanny look which girls did not like and so made matters rather worse than better. Of course, looks didn't matter so much in the case of a man. Steve Miller was homely enough, and all marked up with smallpox to boot. Yet he got for wife the prettiest and smartest girl in South Bay. But Steve was rich. Roger was poor and always would be. He worked his stony little farm, from which his father and grandfather had wrestled a fair living. After a fashion, but nature had not cut him out for a successful farmer. He hadn't the strength for it, and his heart wasn't in it. He'd rather be hanging over a book. Catherine secretly thought, Roger's matrimonial chances very poor. But it would not do to discourage the boy. What he needed was spurring on. You'll get someone if you don't fly too high, she announced loudly and cheerfully. There's always a gal or two here and there that's glad to marry for a home. Tain't no use for you to be setting your thoughts on anyone young and pretty. You wouldn't get her, and you'd be worse off if you did. Your grandfather married for looks, and a nice useless wife he got. Sick half a time, and get a good strong girl that ain't afraid of work. That'll hold things together when you're reading poetry. That's as much as you can expect. And the sooner, the better. I'm done. Last winter's rheumatis has about finished me, and we can't afford hired help. Roger felt as if his raw, 
quivering soul were being seared. He looked at his aunt curiously, at her broad, flat face with the mole on the end of her dumpy nose, the bristling hairs on her chin, the wrinkled yellow neck, the pale protruding eyes, the coarse, good-humoured mouth. She was so extremely ugly, and he had seen her across the table all his life. For twenty-five years he had looked at her so. Must he continue to go on looking at ugliness in the shape of a wife all the rest of his life? He who worshipped beauty in everything. Did my mother look like you, Aunt Catherine? he asked abruptly. His aunt stared and snorted. Her snort was meant to express kindly amusement, but it sounded like derision and contempt. Your ma wasn't so humbly as me, she said cheerfully. But she was no beauty either. None of the temples was ever better looking than was necessary. We was workers. Your pa wasn't bad looking. You're humblier than either of them. Some ways you take after your grandma. Though she was counted pretty at one time. She was yaller and spindler like you. And you've got her eyes. What you're so interested in your ma's looks all at once for? I was wondering, said Roger coolly, if father ever looked at her across the table and wished she were prettier. Catherine giggled. Her giggle was ugly and disagreeable, like everything else about her. Everything except a certain odd, loving, loyal old heart buried deep in her bosom, for the sake of which Roger endured the giggle and all the rest. The say he did, the say he did. Man always has a hankering for good looks. But you've got to cut your coat according to your cloth. As for your poor ma, she didn't live long enough to get as ugly as me. When I come here to keep house for your pa, folks said as it wouldn't be long for he married me. I wouldn't mind, but your pa never hinted it. Suppose he had enough of ugly women likely. Catherine snorted amiably again. Roger got up. He couldn't endure any more just then. He must escape. Now you think over what I've said. His aunt called after him. You've got to get a wife soon, however ye manage it. T'won't be so hard if ye're reasonable. Don't stay out as late as you did last night. You coughed all night. Where was ye? Down at the shore? No, said Roger, who always answered her questions even when he hated to. I was down at Aunt Isabel's grave. Till eleven o'clock? Ye ain't wise. I don't know what hankering ye have after that unchancy place. I ain't been near it for twenty years. I wonder ye ain't scared. What do ye think ye'd do if ye saw a ghost? Catherine looked curiously at Roger. She was very superstitious, and she believed firmly in ghosts, and saw no absurdity in her question. I wish I could see it, said Roger, his great eyes flashing. He believed in ghosts too, at least in Isabel's temple's ghost. His uncle had seen it, his grandfather had seen it. He believed he would see it, the beautiful, bewitching, mocking, luring ghost of lovely Isabel Temple. Don't wish such stuff, said Catherine. Nobody ain't never the same after they've seen her. Was Uncle different? Roger had come back into the kitchen and was looking curiously at his aunt. Different? He was another man. He didn't even look the same. Such eyes. 
always looking past ye at something behind ye. They'd give anyone creeps. He never had any notion of flesh and blood women after that. Said a man wouldn't after seeing Isabel. His life was plump ruined. Lucky he died young. I hated to be in the same room with him. He won Kenny. That was all there was to it. You keep away from that grave. You don't want to look odder than ye are by nature. And when ye get married, you'll have to give up Roman about half the night in graveyards. A wife wouldn't put up with it as I've done. I'll never get as good a wife as you, Aunt Catherine, said Roger with a little whimsical smile that gave him the look of an amused gnome. They say you won't, but someone you have to have. Why'n't you try Lisa Adams? She might have you. She's getting on. Lisa Adams? That's what I said. You needn't repeat it. Lisa Adams, as if I mentioned a hippopotamus. I get out of patience with you. I believe in my heart ye think you ought to get a wife that look like a picta. I do, Aunt Catherine. That's just the kind of wife I want. Grace and beauty and charm. Nothing less than that will ever content me. Roger laughed bitterly again and went out. It was sunset. There was no work to do that night except to milk the cows. And his little homeboy could do that. He felt a glad freedom. He put his hand in his pocket to see if his beloved Wordsworth was there, and then he took his way across the fields, under a sky of purple and amber, walking quickly despite his limp. He wanted to get to some solitary place, where he could forget Aunt Catherine and her abominable suggestions, and escape into the world of dreams, where he habitually lived, and where he found the loveliness he had not found, nor could hope to find, in his real world. Roger's mother had died when he was three, and his father when he was eight. His little, old, bedridden grandmother had lived until he was twelve. He had loved her passionately, she had not been pretty in his remembrance. A tiny, shrunken, wrinkled thing, but she had beautiful grey eyes that never grew old, and a soft, gentle voice, the only woman's voice he had ever heard with pleasure. He was very critical as regards women's voices, and very sensitive to them. Nothing hurt him quite so much as an unlovely voice not even on loveliness of face. Her death had left him desolate. She was the only human being who had ever understood him. He could never, he thought, have got through his tortured school days without her. After she died, he would not go to school. He was not, in any sense, educated. His father and grandfather had been illiterate men, and he had inherited their undeveloped brain cells. But he loved poetry, and read all he could get of it. It overlaid his primitive nature with a curious iridescence of fancy, and furnished him with ideals and hungers his environment could never satisfy. He loved beauty in everything. Moonrises hurt him with the loveliness and he could sit for hours gazing at a white narcissus, much to his aunt's exasperation. He was solitary by nature. He felt horribly alone in a crowded building, but never in the woods, or in the wild places along the shore. It was because of this that his aunt could not get him to go to church, which was a horror to her orthodox soul. He told her he would like to go to church, if it were empty, but he could not bear it when it was full, full of smug, ugly people. Most people, he thought, were ugly, though not so ugly as he was, 
and ugliness made him sick with repulsion. Now and then he saw a pretty girl at whom he liked to look, but he never saw one that wholly pleased him. To him, the homely, crippled, poverty-stricken Roger Temple, whom they all would have scorned, there was always a certain subtle something wanting, and the lack of it kept him heart whole. He knew that this probably saved him from much suffering, but for all that he regretted it. He wanted to love, even vainly. He wanted to experience this passion of which the poets sang so much. Without it, he felt he lacked the key to a world of wonder. He even tried to fall in love. He went to church for several Sundays and sat where he could see beautiful Elsa Carey. She was lovely. It gave him pleasure to look at her. The gold of her hair was so bright and living, the pink of her cheek so pure, the curve of her neck so flawless, the lashes of her eyes so dark and silken. But he looked at her as at a picture. When he tried to think and dream of her, it bored him. Besides, he knew she had a rather nasal voice. He used to laugh sarcastically to himself over Elsa's feelings if she had known how desperately he was trying to fall in love with her and failing. Elsa, the Queen of Hearts, who believed she had only to look to reign. He gave up trying at last, but he still longed to love. He knew he would never marry. He could not marry plainness, and beauty would have none of him. But he did not want to miss everything, and he had moments when he was very bitter and rebellious, because he felt he must miss it forever. He went straight to Isabel Temple's grave in the remote shore field of his farm. Isabel Temple had lived and died eighty years ago. She had been very lovely very willful, very fond of playing with the hearts of men. She had married William Temple, the brother of his great-grandfather. And, as she stood in her white dress beside her bridegroom, at the conclusion of the wedding ceremony, a chilted lover, crazed by despair, had entered the house and shot her dead. She had been buried in the shore field, where a square space had been diked off in the center for a burial lot because the church was then so far away. With the passage of years, the lot had grown up so thickly with fir and birch and wild cherry that it looked like a compact grove. A winding path led through it to its heart where Isabel Temple's grave was, thickly overgrown with long, silken pale green grass. Roger hurried along the path and sat down on the big grey boulder by the grave, looking about him with a long breath of delight. How lovely, and witching, and unearthly it was here. Little ferns were growing in the hollows and cracks of the big boulder where clay had lodged. Over Isabel Temple's crooked, lichened gravestone hung a young wild cherry in its delicate bloom. Above it, in a little space of sky, left by the slender treetops, was a young moon. It was too dark here, after all, to read Woodsworth, but that did not matter. The place, with its moist air, its tang of fir balsam, was like a perfumed room where a man might dream dreams and see visions. And there was a soft murmur of wind in the bows over him, and the faraway moan of the sea on the bar crept in. Roger surrendered himself utterly to the charm of the place. When he entered that grove, he had left behind the realm of daylight and things known, and come into the realm of shadow and mystery and enchantment. Anything might happen, 
anything might be true. Eighty long years had come and gone, but Isabel Temple, thus cruelly torn from life at the moment when it had promised her most, did not even yet rest calmly in her grave. Such, at least, was the story, and Roger believed it. It was in his blood to believe it. The Temples were a superstitious family, and there was nothing in Roger's upbringing to correct the tendency. His was not a skeptical or scientific mind. He was ignorant and poetical and credulous. He had always accepted unquestioningly the tale that Isabel Temple had been seen on earth long after the red clay was heaped over her murdered body. Her bridegroom had seen her, when he went to visit her on the eve of his second and unhappy marriage. His grandfather had seen her. His grandmother, who had told him Isabel's story, had told him this too, and believed it. She had added, with a bitterness foreign to his idea of her, that her husband had never been the same to her afterwards. His uncle had seen her and had lived and died a haunted man. It was only to men the lovely, restless ghost appeared, and her appearance boded no good to him who saw. Roger knew this, but he had a curious longing to see her. He had never avoided her grave as others of his tribe did. He loved the spot and he believed that some time he would see Isabel Temple there. She came, so the story went, to one in each generation of the family. He gazed down at her sunken grave. A little wind that came stealing along the floor of the grove raised and swayed the long, hair-like grass on it, giving the curious suggestion of something prisoned under it trying to draw a long breath and float upward. Then, when he lifted his eyes again, he saw her. She was standing behind the gravestone, under the cherry tree, whose long white branches touched her head, standing there with her head drooping a little, but looking steadily at him. It was just between dusk and dark now, but he saw her very plainly. She was dressed in white, with some filmy scarf over her head, and her hair hung in the dark, heavy braid over her shoulder. Her face was small and ivory white, and her eyes were very large and dark. Roger looked straight into them, and they did something to him, drew something out of him that was never to be his again. His heart, his soul, he did not know. He only knew that lovely Isabel Temple had now come to him, and that he was hers forever. For a few moments, that seemed years, he looked at her, looked into the lure of her eyes, drew him to his feet as a man rises in sleepwalking. As he slowly stood up, the low-hanging bough of a fir tree pushed his cap down over his face and blinded him. When he snatched it off, she was gone. Roger Temple did not go home that night till the spring dawn was in the sky. Catherine was sleepless with anxiety about him. When she heard him come up the stairs, she opened the door and peeped out. Roger went along the hall without seeing her. His brilliant eyes stared straight before him, and there was something in his face that made Catherine steal back to her bed with a little shiver of fear. He looked like his uncle. She did not ask him when they met at breakfast, where or how he had spent the night. He had been dreading the question, and was relieved beyond measure when it was not asked. But, apart from that, he was hardly conscious of her presence. He ate and drank mechanically and voicelessly. 
When he had gone out, Catherine wagged her uncomely grey head ominously. He's bewitched, she murmured. He's seen her, drat her. It's time she gave up that kind of work. Well, I don't know what to do. There ain't anything I can do, I reckon. He'll never marry now. I'm as sure of that as of any mortal thing. He's in love with a ghost. It had not yet occurred to Roger that he was in love. He thought of nothing but Isabel Temple. Her lovely, lovely face, sweeter than any picture he had ever seen or any ideal he had dreamed. Her long dark hair, her slim form, and, more than all, her compelling eyes. He saw them wherever he looked. They drew him. He would have followed them to the end of the world, heedless of all else. He longed for night, that he might again steal to the grave in the haunted grove. She might come again, who knew? He felt no fear, nothing but a terrible hunger to see her again. But she did not come that night, nor the next, nor the next. Two weeks went by, and he had not seen her. Perhaps he would never see her again. The thought filled him with anguish not to be born. He knew now that he loved her, Isabel Temple, dead for eighty years. This was love. This searing, torturing, intolerably sweet thing. This possession of body and soul and spirit. The poets had sung but weakly of it. He could tell them better if he could find words. Could other men have loved at all? Could any man love those blousy, common girls of earth? It seemed impossible, absurd. There was only one thing that could be loved, the white spirit. No wonder his uncle had died. He, Roger Temple, would soon die too. That would be well. Only the dead could woo Isabel. Meanwhile, he reveled in his torment and his happiness. So madly commingled that he never knew whether he was in heaven or hell. It was beautiful and dreadful and wonderful and exquisite. Oh, so exquisite. Mortal love could never be so exquisite. He had never lived before. Now he lived in every fiber of his being. He was glad Aunt Catherine did not worry him with questions. He had feared she would, but she never asked any questions now. And she was afraid of Roger, as she had been afraid of his uncle. She dared not ask questions. It was a thing that must not be tempered with. Who knew what she might hear if she asked him questions? She was very unhappy. Something dreadful had happened to her poor boy. He had been bewitched by that hussy. He would die as his uncle had died. Maybe it's best, she muttered. He's the last of the temples, so maybe she'll rest in her grave when she's killed them all. I don't know what she's such a spite at them for. There'd be more sense if she haunted the Mortons, seeing as a Morton killed her. Well, I'm mighty old and tired and worn out. It don't seem that it's been much use, the way I've slaved and fussed to bring that boy up and keep things together for him. And now the ghost's got him. I might as well have let him die when he was a sickly baby. If this had been said to Roger, he would have retorted that it was worthwhile to have lived long enough to feel what he was feeling now. He would not have missed it for a score of other men's lives. He had drunk of some immortal wine and was as a god. Even if she never came again, he had seen her once, and she had taught him life's great secret, 
in that one unforgettable exchange of eyes. She was his, his in spite of his ugliness and his crooked shoulder. No man could ever take her from him. But she did come again. One evening, when the darkening grove was full of magic in the light of the rising yellow moon shining across the level field, Roger sat on the big boulder by the grave. The evening was very still. There was no sound save the echoes of noisy laughter that seemed to come up from the bay shore. Drunken fishermen, likely as not. Roger resented the intrusion of such a sound in such a place. It was a sacrilege. When he came here to dream of her, only the loveliest of muted sounds should be heard, the faintest whisper of trees, the half-heard, half-felt moan of surf, the airiest sigh of wind. He never read Woodsworth now or any other book. He only sat there and thought of her, his great eyes alight, his pale face flush with the wonder of his love. She slipped through the dark boughs like a moonbeam and stood by the stone. Again he saw her quite plainly, saw and drank her in with his eyes. He did not feel surprise. Something in him had known she would come again. He would not move a muscle lest he lose her as he had lost her before. They looked at each other. For how long, he did not know. And then, a horrible thing happened. Into that place of wonder and revelation and mystery reeled a hiccoughing, laughing creature, a drunken sailor from a harbor ship with a leering face and desecrating breath. Oh, you're here, my dear. I thought I'd catch you yet. He caught hold of her. She screamed. Roger sprang forward and struck him in the face. In his fury of sudden rage, the strength of ten seemed to animate his slender body and pass into his blow. The sailor reeled back and put up his hands. He was a coward, and even a brave man might have been daunted by that terrible white face and those blazing eyes. He backed down the path. Shari, Shari, he muttered. Didn't know she was your girl. Shari, I butted in. Gentlemen's never butt in. Shari, sure, so shari. He kept repeating his ridiculous shari until he was out of the grove. Then he turned and ran stumblingly across the field. Roger did not follow. He went back to Isabel Temple's grave. The girl was lying across it. He thought she was unconscious. He stooped and picked her up. She was light and small, but she was warm flesh and blood. She clung uncertainly to him for a moment, and he felt her breath on his face. He did not speak. He was too sick at heart. She did not speak either. He did not think this strange until afterwards. He was incapable of thinking just then. He was dazed, wretched, lost. Presently he became aware that she was timidly pulling his arm. It seemed that she wanted him to go with her. She was evidently frightened of that brute. He must take her to safety. And then... She moved on down the little path, and he followed. Out in the moonlit field he saw her clearly. With her drooping head, her flowing dark hair, her great brown eyes, she looked like a nymph of a wood brook, a haunter of shadows, a creature sprung from the wild. But she was mortal maid, and he, what a fool he had been, Presently he would laugh at himself when this dazed agony should clear away from his brain. He followed her down to the long field to the bay shore. 
Now and then she paused and looked back to see if he were coming, but she never spoke. When she reached the shore road, she turned and went along it until they came to an old grey house, fronting the calm grey harbour. At this gate she paused. Roger knew now who she was. Catherine had told him about her a month ago. She was Lilith Barr, a girl of eighteen, who had come to live with her uncle and aunt. Her father had died some months before. She was absolutely deaf as the result of some accident in her childhood. And she was, as his own eyes told him, exquisitely lovely in her white, haunting style. But she was not Isabel Temple. He had tricked himself. He had lived in a fool's paradise. Oh, he must get away and laugh at himself. He left her at the gate, disregarding the little hand she put timidly out. But he did not laugh at himself. He went back to Isabel Temple's grave and flung himself down on it and cried like a boy. He wept his stormy, anguished soul out on it. And when he rose and went away, he believed it was forever. He thought he could never, never go there again. Catherine looked at him curiously the next morning. He looked wretched, haggard and hollow-eyed. She knew he had not come in till the summer dawn. But he had lost the rapt, uncanny look she hated. Suddenly she no longer felt afraid of him. With this she began to ask questions again. What kept ye out so late again last night, boy? She said reproachfully. Roger looked at her in her morning ugliness. He had not really seen her for weeks. Now she smote on his tortured senses. So long drugged with beauty, like a physical blow. He suddenly burst into a laughter that frightened her. Preserves, boy, have you gone mad? Or, she added, have you seen Isabel Temple's ghost? No, said Roger loudly and explosively. Don't talk any more about that damn ghost. Nobody ever saw it. The whole story is balderdash. He got up and went violently out, leaving Catherine aghast. Was it possible Roger had sworn? What on earth had come over the boy? But come what had, or come what would, he had no longer looked thee. There was that much to be thankful for. Even an occasional oath was better than that. Catherine went stiffly about her dishwashing resolving to have Lisa Adams to supper some night. For a week, Roger lived in agony, an agony of shame and humiliation and self-contempt. Then, when the edge of his bitter disappointment wore away, he made another dreadful discovery. He still loved her and longed for her just as keenly as before. He wanted madly to see her, her flower-like face, her great asking eyes, the sleek braided flow of her hair. Ghost or woman, spirit of flesh, it mattered not. He could not live without her. At last his hunger for her drew him to the old grey house on the bay shore. He knew he was a fool. She would never look at him. He was only feeding the flame that must consume him. But go he must and did, seeking for his lost paradise. He did not see her when he went in, but Mrs. Barr received him kindly and talked about her in a pleasant, garrulous fashion which jarred on Roger, yet he listened greedily. Lilith, her aunt told him, had been made deaf by the accidental explosion of a gun when she was eight years old. She could not hear a sound, but she could talk. 
A little, that is, not much, but enough to get along with. But she don't like talking somehow, don't know why. She's shy, and we think maybe she don't like to talk much because she can't hear her own voice. She don't ever speak, except just when she has to. But she's been training to lip-reading, something wonderful. She can understand anything that's said when she can see the person that's talking. Still, it's a terrible drawback for a poor child. She's never had any real girl life. And she's dreadful sensitive and retiring. We can't get her to go out anywhere, only for lonely walks along shore by herself. We are much obliged for what you did the other night. It ain't safe for her to wander about alone as she does. But it ain't often anybody from the harbor gets up this far. She was dreadful upset about it. Hasn't got over her scare yet. When Lilith came in, her ivory-white face went scarlet all over at the side of Roger. She sat down in a shadowy corner. Mrs. Barr got up and went out. Roger was mute. He could find nothing to say. He could have talked glibly enough to Isabel Temple's ghost and some unearthly tryst by her grave. But he could not find a word to say to this slip of flesh and blood. He felt very foolish and absurd and very conscious of his twisted shoulder. What a fool he had been to come. Then Lilith looked up at him and smiled. A little shy, friendly smile. Roger suddenly saw her not as a tantalizing, unreal, mystic thing of the twilight grove, but as a little human creature, exquisitely pretty in her young moon beauty, longing for companionship. He got up, forgetting his ugliness, and went across the room to her. Will you come for a walk? he said eagerly. He held out his hand like a child. As a child she stood up and took it. Like two children, they went out and down the sunset shore. Roger was again incredibly happy. It was not the same happiness as had been his in that vanished fortnight. It was a homelier happiness with its feet on the earth. The amazing thing was that he felt she was happy too. Happy because she was walking with him, Jack Barr Temple, whom no girl had even thought about. A certain secret wellspring of fancy that had seemed dry welled up in him sparkling again. Through the summer weeks, the odd courtship went on. Roger talked to her as he had never talked to anyone. He did not find it in the least hard to talk to her, though her necessity of watching his face so closely while he talked bothered him occasionally. He felt that her intent gaze was reading his soul as well as his lips. She never talked much herself. What she did say, she spoke so low that it was hardly above a whisper. But she had a voice as lovely as her face, sweet, cadenced, haunting. Roger was quite mad about her, and he was horribly afraid that he could never get up enough courage to ask her to marry him. And he was afraid that if he did, she would never consent. In spite of her shy, eager welcomes, he could not believe she could care for him. For him. She liked him. She was sorry for him. But it was unthinkable that she, white, exquisite Lilith, could marry him and sit at his table and his hearth. He was a fool to dream of it. To the existence of romance and glamour in which he lived, no gossip of the countryside penetrated. 
Yet much gossip there was, and at last it came blundering in on Raja to destroy his fairy world a second time. He came downstairs one night in the twilight, ready to go to Lilith. His aunt and an old crony were talking in the kitchen. The crony was old, and Catherine, supposing Roger was out of the house, was talking loudly in that horrible voice of hers, with still more horrible zest and satisfaction. Yes, I'm guessing it'll be a match, as ye say. Oh, the boy's doing well. He ain't for every market, as I'm bound to admit. If she wasn't deaf, she wouldn't look at him, no doubt. But she has gats of money. They won't need to do a tap of work unless they like. And she's a good housekeeper, too, her aunt tells me. She's pretty enough to suit him. He's as particular as never was. And he won crooked and she won death when they was born, so it's likely their children will be all right. I'm that proud when I think of the match. Roger fled out of the house, white of face and sick of heart. He went, not by the bay shore, but to Isabel Temple's grave. He had never been there since the night when he had rescued Lilith, but now he rushed to it in his new agony. His aunt's horrible practicalities had filled him with disgust. They dragged his love in the dust of sordid things. And Lilith was rich. He had never known that, never suspected it. He could never ask her to marry him now. He must never see her again. For the second time he had lost her, and this second losing could not be born. He sat down on the big boulder by the grave and dropped his poor grey face in his hands, moaning in anguish. Nothing was left him, not even dreams. He hoped he could soon die. He did not know how long he sat there. He did not know when she came. But when he lifted his miserable eyes, he saw her sitting just a little way from him on the big stone and looking at him with something in her face that made his heart beat madly. He forgot Aunt Catherine's sacrilege. He forgot that he was a presumptuous fool. He bent forward and kissed her lips for the first time. The wonder of it loosed his bound tongue. Lilith, he gasped. I love you. She put a hand into his and nestled closer to him. I thought you would have told me that long ago, she said.